Well, shucks, I can't seem to get that working. You can tell I'm a real professional. Two things happened. We passed 14K subscribers, which is uh, nice, especially for something that I kind of do on the side. Believe me, if I won the lottery, I would do it full time because I love this stuff, but I have a family to support, so I do have a, a day job. And the other thing that happened was that OBS now supports AV1 encoding. Despite my love of all things vintage computing, I really, really love the bleeding edge of certain aspects of tech, like uh, video encoding, sound compression, audio compression, stuff like that. And I have an RTX 4090, I splurged. I guess I should apologize for that. Uh, and it has AV1 encoding and hardware. And so I thought, let's give it a try. So this is a 4K 30 frame per second stream, 30p stream. And we are trying to restrict our bandwidth to six megabits. And so far, uh, I think it looks fine. It's even broadcasting uh, live up to 1440p and then the replay will be in 4K. So that's actually, that's really cool. So. It is nice now and then to be on the bleeding edge of stuff. The channel is called The Old School PC. Everyone thinks that that's it and that I live in the past, but um, I gotta be honest, I've been having a lot of fun running stable diffusion, you know, picture generation models on my local PC, which is the kind of, we live in the future moment that, you know, you always dream you would, ha you would have as a kid. That's another crazy thing. As a teenager, I loved cyberpunk. I saw the birth of cyberpunk. I was like 14 when Neuromancer came out, 16 when Akira came out, Blade Runner, the whole thing. And it's like, and now we have a game. We have Cyberpunk 2077, which like perfectly realizes that vision, which is amazing. We have hardware that can run it with real time ray tracing, which is also amazing. We live in the future. Or to paraphrase Louis C.K., everything's amazing and no one is happy. I, I have a love of, I'm not going to call them bad movies, I'll call them cheesy movies. I have a love of movies that are not made very well, but you could tell they were trying. So I suppose like Mystery Science Theater 3000, I can appreciate a bad movie here and there. Not bad, but you know, they, they, they missed their mark. Currently my, my latest bad movie laughing fit was Rhapsody Street Kids, the Christmas film. <laughs> they thought that they could produce a feature length film using consumer software that lets you move 3D objects around, but you can't model them. You can't create your own animations. It is exactly as terrible as you think it would be. You know, the software was written in 1995 to run on Windows systems, and that's how they're going to make a, a film. It, it has to be seen to be believed. Uh, and it was broadcast on actual live television, which is really crazy. There was some chatter on the PC Junior forum while back about rewriting the PC Junior BIOS. What do you think could be done? by such an endeavor. There's a couple of things you could probably do with regards to compatibility, maybe, if you tried to rewrite parts of the PC Junior BIOS. However, it's packed pretty tight. There's not a lot of extra room in there. Not only that, you run the risk of possibly messing up some cartridge, some retail games that used uh, cartridge ROM basic because some basic programs would like peak, you know, or call routines like at known locations. So if you shuffle stuff around in the ROM, it's usually not a good idea. The, the more practical use of trying to rewrite parts of the PC Junior BIOS would be some sort of BIOS extension or overlay for use with a Junior IDE uh, rev model. Alan Hightower, I think for a while, wanted to add uh, real-time clock routines, like like support that part of the BIOS, like the AT BIOS has, you know, these real-time clock routines, the functions, API. And so that way you could set your date in DOS and then every time you reboot, it'll load it out of that. And the Junior IDE has a real-time clock. So that's the kind of stuff I see making more sense. Or updating the XT IDE code to support, like go from CHS, which is what I think it is now, to LBA. It, some people seem to think you can you can fix the compatibility through the BIOS. You can't. The PC Junior was deliberately cost cut, and the the parts of it that are incompatible are directly due to the hardware design. You know, if you wonder why you can't hit a key while you're reading a floppy drive or something, that's because there is no keyboard controller. The CPU is doing it. So unfortunately, BIOS uh, patches can't really address that. The whirring and rattling hard drive is part of the experience, which is why I have real systems with real hardware and real drives and real noises and real delays 
and real error read retries, but I also have systems that use all flash. And I also use emulators. I don't think you can rely on any one specific thing to enjoy this hobby. I think you need both emulation and real hardware to further the hobby and further the history. Emulators have strengths and weaknesses. Even FPGA emulators, and they are hardware emulators, have weaknesses. Not a lot, but they do have some. And the biggest weakness all emulators have is that if you have hardware that hasn't been emulated yet, you're out of luck. I think it's up to vintage computer enthusiasts to maintain the hardware so that emulator authors have something to base their, their results off of. Honestly, when we wrote 88 miles per hour, if you remember the last line of that, it was, this is only the beginning of what we can do, which is a huge flex, but it was true. What can you do? We broke every emulator with that demo on purpose because we wanted emulator authors to step up their game. Unfortunately, I guess there's not enough people who care about emulating the original PC that nobody did. So you may be happy to know that we did. One of our group members came up with an 8088 cycle exact emulator and it is in PCE, I think, and it should be included in other stuff pretty soon. They run a hard disk drive just for the nostalgic sound. I agree, an ST, a Seagate ST225 is probably the classic PC hard drive sound. It is also, unfortunately, one of the default sounds that anyone goes to whenever they have to do any hard drive sound. I remember watching a CSI episode in the mid-2000s, and they had to do some fancy computer stuff, and all of a sudden I hear, like, Mac floppy drive noises and Seagate ST225 MFM noises, and I'm like, come on, really? It's 2000, you're not running that hardware. Anyway, it was all kind of silly. It was of the vein of Enhance, which uh, even with AI is still impossible. You can't create detail if it isn't there. I think the mindset is amazing. There are two popular, popular-ish large videos on the mindset. One is from David Murray, the 8-bit guy, where he shows it off and does a general overview. And then there's an extreme deep dive of the mindset by Tech Time Traveler, who in a very short time has created a, a nice large cache of wonderful videos, and I highly suggest you subscribe to the both of them, uh, but especially Tech Time Traveler, because he uh, puts a lot of heart and soul into his videos. And he did a great thing on the mindset. The mindset is like this ama- the mindset is best described as a PC with Amiga guts. Uh, you know, it's got Sony guts. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's a PC with Amiga guts. It has a coprocessor for blitting the graphics and graphics primitives. And it has like six voice wavetable audio. I think it's six voices. And there's a demo that came with the mindset. And it, it plays almost like the video game Blaster. It plays just like Blaster. And... You're like, this is a PC, like in 83 or 84. Unfortunately, it's also massively crippled. I think it was expandable up to 256K of RAM. That's not a good sign. And it was not PC compatible, but it did run MS-DOS. So it was MS-DOS compatible, the dreaded MS-DOS compatible line of systems. You can also add K-Pro to that. Anyway, uh, it would be wonderful to do a whole video on MS-DOS compatible 8088 systems. But basically, the issue is that it's extremely unstable and programs crash at random. That is usually the result of two things. Bad RAM, so test your RAM, where you might have a weak bit or a flaky bit, and you might think, it's just one bit. Hey, one bit will take it down. Or, if it's random and the memory tests out okay, you probably have some cold solder joints on the motherboard. Cold solder joints are when the solder was not, it's not a good mix of tin and lead and whatever it is that it's made of, and or it was soldered at the wrong temperature. After time, solder joints get weak and they crack, and these are called cold solder joints. And you can fix them quickly by reflowing the solder. I mean, the proper thing is to get the old solder out and put new ones in, but you can reflow the solder just by getting it hot letting it melt and then letting it cool again. And so as you use the computer, it gets warm. And as it gets warm, it expands. And as it expands, those cold solder joints will disconnect their electrical connection. And 
It might not be something digital that is super easy to see, like RAM or video card or something like that. It might be something analog, which is you know, like, you know, like a resistor or a capacitor, something that regulates voltage or current. And so the system freaks out in a, in a, in a weird way or an odd way, like, a, like a, an analog way. So try those things. I used to think I was the first person who uploaded a 60p video to YouTube and had it play in 60p. Unfortunately, I found an example from 2009, so I'm not the first, but it was, I essentially, I, I was creating and uploading 60p video before YouTube officially supported it. And when they did add support in 2014 or 2015, uh, retroactively, all those videos now suddenly played in 60p. And one of them was the world of Tron 2.0, which was up until Tron Legacy was official canon sequel to Tron. And I still think it is, I mean, I think it's great. I think everyone should at least try playing Tron 2.0. The soundtrack is amazing. The composer won a gaming industry award for the soundtrack. It, 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 it not only integrates some of Wendy Carlos's leitmotifs from the original soundtrack, but it also comes up with its own wonderful pieces. And so just that alone. And also it's kind of cool to walk around in the, in the world of Tron. And I thought the graphics were awesome. And that's why I made a video called The World of Tron 2.0 about formatting discs in the background. Was it the case that the 286 could only support cooperative multitasking and 3D6 could support preemptive multitasking? Those two statements are true, but you didn't need a 286 or a 386 to format discs in the background. Uh, Chuck Guzzi's, G-U-Z-I-S, I think I'm, I hope I'm not butchering your name, Chuck, I'm sorry if I am who created software you might know, like SimCGA, Teledisc, and Anadisc, also created a series of floppy disk formatting programs, and one of them is memory resident, and it will format a floppy in the background. It's a TSR, you hit a key, you stick at a floppy, you confirm, and then you go about your business while it formats. I think it's a neat trick. I'm not totally sure how useful it is because it only takes 45 seconds to format a five and a quarter inch disk, so, you know. I mean, maybe, I don't know, high density ones are like, what, a minute and a half? You know, I can save what I'm doing, exit to DOS, format a disk, and go back in. It's not a big deal. You'd be surprised how little it takes to create a, a, a really useful processor. You need something to trap hardware writes and or manage memory, like a memory management unit, and then virtual registers. What is multitasking other than, you know, saving state and then going somewhere and restoring state? And when you do that at the lowest hardware level, you save all the registers, and then you, you restore the data for the, for the next program you're switching to, and you restore all the registers. And one of the reasons uh, Sun Microsystems hardware in the late 2000s, like you know 2010 or something, uh, Sun came out with this cool hardware that could multitask. It could create something like 128 threads or 256 threads. And the only magic it really had was that it had 128 different register sets in hardware. So to task switch to a new process, it would just be like, okay, now we're on set number two. And suddenly all the registers change. It's like rotating a, a, a rotary knob to go to the different hardware registers. We intentionally did RGBI TTL monitors for the latest demo, Area 5150, because we felt it would be more compatible across the pond for people in PAL countries. We also thought it would be more compatible with emulators. We're really, our, our secondary goal of making these demos is to try to get emulator authors to step up their game. I want to hear a funny story about calling it pop. It's vintage computer related, trust me. Back when I was still with Moby Games, we uh, were at Classic Gaming Expo 2003, no, 2004, 2005. We were at two of them, and in the last one we were there, we were trying to drum up support for Moby Games. We realized back then that what we had created inadvertently was a a community-supported uh, gaming database, which, in order to survive, needed the support of the community. So we were there, and people were like, you know, how, why are you promoting Moby Games? Well, just because we wanted more people to know about it, and the more people that know about it might contribute some game info. And the more people that contribute game info, the more useful the site is for everybody. So we were at Classic Gaming Expo, we set up a booth and we were running a little trivia game. And if you participated, you could get a, a, a can of soda. And if you won the trivia game, we'd give you a free t-shirt. And this is California. So I, I, I do call it pop. I, 
when I'm speaking informally and just as myself, I guess it, that's what I'm doing now. I, I call it pop because I'm mostly from the Midwest. I spent most of my time in Illinois with a six year stint in New Jersey. And I've always called it pop. So I remember r running the trivia game at Classic Gaming Expo and this guy in a, I think a Raiden costume walked by and he was sort of interested in what was going on the projector. I'm like, hey, you want to play a trivia game? And he kind of looked at me like, oh, I'm not so sure. And I'm like, well, hey, you get a you get a free pop just for trying. And he turned and he stopped and he turned and he looked at me and he goes, it's soda. It's like, geez, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was breaking some Southern California rule here. <laughs> just a hick from the Midwest. I still have a 20 megabyte plus hard card in one of my 5150s and it actually still works. Well, you're super lucky that that still works because all of the rubber in there, including the backstop for the heads, has turned to gunk. So at some point you are going to have stiction problems. Uh, one of my very first vintage computer tech videos on YouTube, I want to say 2008, 2009, I, I take the cover off of a plus hard card 20 megabyte and I and I show like what is stiction and I use a q-tip to like pop the head off the platter and spin it back up so the 20s and the 40s somehow usually still work all other plus hard cards are dead they're d dead as a doornail they the EEPROMs like fade and they become empty I think people have resurrected them by burning new EEPROMs but that's cold comfort if you don't have the image to from the for the specific model that you have the Access guys, about what, six years ago, uh, had a Kickstarter for the Tesla effect, which was a, a conclusion to the Tex Murphy saga. And they shot all new 4K video for it. And the environments are true 3D instead of like quasi 3D with textures. And I loved it. I, you know, for a Kickstarter project by a scrappy band of like 10 people, Chris. Whoever played Tex Murphy, I mean, he was involved, he played Tex Murphy, the voice actors, everything. It was great. I loved the Tesla effect. I thought it was done really well. It's a little odd in that they hit a stretch goal to add more stages to the adventure game. Unfortunately, you can see as you play the game, you're pretty sure it's going to end. You go through a really hard puzzle. There's a huge cinematic and you're like, this is the end of the game. And then suddenly there's one more day of stuff to do tacked on. And you're like, ugh, that's where the stretch goal was. So you don't have to finish it, but it's really great. I do have a Silicon Valley ADP 50. In fact, I've got two of them. And one of them is in use on the PC you see right here on the screen. This one that is currently running a Silicon Valley. In fact, what the heck? Let's actually see if we can, if we can prove it. Let's go into debug and start dumping some ROMs. Where, is, where are you hiding, Silicon Valley ADP? Nope, you're not there. You're probably here. There you are. Look at your ROM hiding at C800. There you go. If you come to the Midwest and you attend Midwest Gaming Classic, which is a show held in Wisconsin every April-ish, usually the, the guy or, or some sort of special gaming event at the Galloping Ghost Arcade in Brookfield, Illinois, uh, you have a very high chance of seeing Danny Piscina. And I can tell you firsthand, he's a really nice guy. He and a couple of Mortal Kombat actors had a table at the last Midwest Gaming Classic that I attended. I think it was the one right before COVID. They would sign and sell merch and things like that, pose for pictures for a fee or something like that. My oldest son, who is autistic, wandered up to them and did not know, did not understand that, you know, when you see celebrities selling things you know you're supposed to it's not just posters for for viewing you're supposed to buy something but he went up to them and he chatted and he asked some questions and when i walked up to to catch him i just saw danny piscina smiling and answering all of his questions and not asking anything in return guys all right in my book one of my most favorite demo scene names for a sceneer which i discovered by walking behind him in the uh in the piss tunnel at revision 2015 uh doctor scientist <laughs> i don't know why it just tickles me doctor scientist let's generate cga snow on purpose the cga compatibility tester which you can find online specifically has a test to generate cga snow and to prove this is a real system well i mean i guess some emulators you know will will do this too now but this is a real system and that's real cga snow 
CGA Snow, for those who don't know, is a display artifact because the memory is not dual ported on a CGA video card. And what that means is that if the CPU and the card uh, try to access video memory at the same time, the CPU wins and the CGA card, instead of reading the byte at, that lo at the location, it will read random garbage. And so that's what you're seeing. So how am I generating the snow? All I'm doing is reading one word constantly in, in RAM, and I'm doing it in a very tight loop, which means that half the time the CPU wins and half the time the, the video card wins. So isn't that fun? I am not normally a nostalgia person because my mission is to try to promote accurate vintage computer history by setting the record straight showing where people can look up actual facts instead of taking their word for it. For example, the PC Junior chiclet keyboard, it's not as bad as you think. It's not as bad as the press makes out. You need to, why don't you actually try it? But I recognize some people like nostalgia. My earliest childhood computer memory is uh, in the mid seventies when I was six years old, my father worked for Teletype Corporation. He had two degrees, one in engineering and one in journalism and he found a job at teletype writing technical manuals perfect combination of the skills right and he would occasionally bring his work home and the earliest memory i have interacting with anything with a keyboard and a screen is he brought home a serial logic analyzer so you connect it in line into a serial communication and it would you know you could configure it and try to figure out you know is this eight bits or seven bits is this ascii is this ebsidic that kind of thing and he had me sit on his lap and I would hit keys on the keyboard and I would see the letter I hit show up on the tiny little one line screen. It was a gas plasma screen. I remember that. That's the very, very first memory I have of operating a computer. After that, I think the next memory I have in 1979 was using an educational game on an Apple II. I don't even think it was a two plus on an Apple II. We had one of them in the entire elementary school. And then the year after that, 1980, I played Colossal Cave Adventure on an Osborne CPM system at my friend's house across the street. And that, as they, as they say, is the start of the journey. I'm not familiar with every reproduction sound card he's done, but I have to give props to the Snark Barker for having the coolest name ever. The Snark, <laughs> the snark Barker makes me laugh every time I say it. What a funny, what a funny name. <clears throat> Yeah, that'll get past copyright, sure. It's not a sound blaster, it's a snark barker. There's a joke we had in the 1990s demo scene, which was someday someone is going to come out with a demo that uses Gravis Ultrasound sound card RAM for graphics and graphics RAM for sound. <laughs> no, nobody ever... I don't think anybody actually did that, although I do know of one demo that couldn't fit in 640K and they did use unused VGA RAM as scratch space. Honestly, I think it was Chronologia by Cascada. I think it was during the dance scene. It'd be really funny to see if someone could dump all the dump the video RAM and that thing running and see what happens. So we couldn't afford a computer in 1983, but we could afford a computer magazine subscription. So I read and read and read. I would get a PC magazine and I would get out the, the reader service cards and I would circle like every goddamn number that appealed to me. And I got so much cool shit in the mail. <laughs> demo discs and one of the best things i have is an ad lib advertisement on a flexi disc record i will put this online someday i just i don't want i want to be <laughs> so sad i have done so much archival work over the decades just once i would like to be recognized for saving something <laughs> so i will put the contents of that ad lib flexi disc record up it's like from 1986 or 87. Anyway, I'll put it up at some point. My oldest son, Sam, I introduced him to computers when he was three years old with Putt Putt Joins the Parade, the DOS, you know, 320, 200, 256 version. And he sat on my lap and together we moved the mouse and clicked on things and made things happen. And he laughed and laughed. And that is when uh, I felt like I was not totally failing as a parent. Hey, here's a fun fact about King's Quest. If you have the original booter version, the Rumpelstiltskin puzzle is way harder than the DOS version. The DOS version, you have to type something and it's like a cipher of Rumpelstiltskin. It's like a rot 13 of it or something. And all the, all the letters are lined up. You get enough clues, you can do it on your own. 
the Buddha version, the original version, the 1984 version. You have to do the same thing, but then enter Rumpelstiltskin's converted name backwards. And at no point is there any clue in the game for that. And that is the first time we ever called a company to try to get a hint on how the hell do you complete this game. And he called uh, on the speakerphone. And I remember uh, in 85, I don't think they had a dedicated helpline. I think we ended up going to customer support or something. I would love to swear on the stream, but I'm gonna try to keep it clean just so that the YouTube gods are happy. But screw that puzzle, man. Screw that puzzle with a broom handle. We worked on it. My friend Court and I, we worked on it. I have memories of us working on it for, for like two hours, thinking we were crazy. And then finally, we had to pay long distance to call Sierra to, to get a, well, well, his dad, his dad paid for the long distance call, which he doesn't know, which he never knew about. But uh, yeah, screw that puzzle, man. My first PC in my house was a clone and it also suffered from snow. And I very quickly learned, you know, if you had one of these speed up programs, they would speed up text mode, but then you'd have this snow. I learned early on to just get used to snow. And I think people who see it they're like, why would you leave that there? Why would you not do anything to avoid it? I'm like, you know, after a while, I just, it's like the matrix. After a while, I don't even see the numbers anymore. You know, I don't even see the code. The Sierra adventures were frustrating to me in that it was a text parser, like an interactive fiction game, but it was also dependent on the positioning of your avatar. So if you wanted to, in, a, in an interactive fiction game, if you, if you're in a room with a key and you say, take key it goes taken in a sierra game if you're in a room with a key but you're not right next to it you say take key and it goes you are too far away okay so then you walk the avatar over and then you take key and then you take the key if the game knew you were too far away why didn't it just walk you over there to take the key why why Ugh. the positional avatar in those agi and, and sci games was a gimmick rather than anything useful and to date, it's why I've only finished like a handful of those games. And I really don't like them. I understand they were breaking ground. Every, it was a no man's land when they started. Some ideas worked, some didn't. I get that, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. I actually do write my, my 8088 software on a real 8088. I mean, not all the time. Sometimes I, I prototype it in DOSBox and get like the basics out of the way. But when it comes to stuff like this, you know, where I'm I'm doing exact stuff, well, actually it's timing dependent, but if, I, if I'm doing something that is timing dependent or hardware dependent, I will write it and compile it and assemble it on the system so that I can immediately run the code. For me, that's fastest. For some other people like Andrew Jenner, I mentioned before, one of his favorite workflows is to do everything in NASM on a Windows machine. And then he has his XT set up, so brilliant. He has his XT set up as like a, a server that accepts remote code sent over the keyboard port, which is then connected and modified to go to either TCP IP or serial via an Arduino, I think it is. I'd love for him to write that whole thing up. It's so cool. And what he'll do is he'll write on Windows in, and he'll assemble in NASM and then he'll quickly send his code over and it will immediately execute on his XT. That's fast and that's cool. I can't do that. He has not mass produced to this interface. So I sometimes find it super easy to just do my work on the actual machine. I have used PCEM a couple of times and I, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. I just prefer to use the real hardware. I completely skipped the slot processors. I went from a Pentium 2 233 my very next machine was a one gigahertz Athlon. And then my next machine after that was a two gigahertz Pentium 4, I think. And then past that, it was an Athlon 64. And then, trying to remember. And then a Core i7-920, the very first Core i7s. And I ran that thing into the ground. It, ba it barely runs for more than five minutes. I must have fried something on the motherboard. Well, I overclocked it for like eight years. So of course I fried something on it. And then I did a Core i7 8700 ran that for five years and now i'm on my brand new rig that i built a couple of months ago and it is glorious it is a raptor lake i9 3900 with an nvidia rtx 4090 and i can't tell you how wonderful it is to have my computer waiting for me not the other way around it's really weird becoming 
a subject matter expert on a, on a specific machine. I think I can call myself that. I hope I'm not breaking my arm, patting myself on the back. But like, I, I now consider myself really good with this machine. I write stuff in assembler. I tried to get this good to impress teenage me and succeeded. But then I started doing other fun stuff like disassembling games and trying to figure out how they did some stuff so fast and whatever. And then sometimes it can be disappointing because you'll run across something that you never got a chance to actually try. Like you only read about it in magazines or whatever. And then when you finally do try it, it's a huge disappointment. Anyone ever play Cybergenic Ranger? It's the game I love to crap on. And thankfully, I, I thought I was the only person crapping on it. It had digitized graphics and digitized audio through the speaker because they licensed real sound. You look at the box and you're like, this game looks awesome. And then you start the game and it kind of starts pretty awesome. It's got good graphics, great sound. And then the game starts. And when you move the character in Cybergenic Ranger, you do it with the arrow keys, which is fine. But the guy never learned how to program a keyboard interrupt. So you tap, you have to tap the keys to make him move forward, back up, up and down. If you hold down the key, he goes once, and then the keyboard repeat kicks in and he goes thunk, 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 thunk. It's a joke. Sometimes that's the curse of, of being really good with the system is that, you know, sometimes you're super disappointed with the code. Thankfully, I am not the only person to crap on Cybergenic Ranger. I am not alone. There was a Games Done Quick charity event where someone speedrun Cybergenic Ranger, and I was vindicated. They were crapping on it so much, and they had so many funny things to say about how bad this logic was. There's At one point, there's this platforming section where if you go off screen and then come back, the platforms are gone. So it's practically impossible to finish. You never know what people are going through. I've tried to be less of a jerk and more empathetic and understanding as I get older, because you never know. I had a friend once who his mother was rich, his father was rich. He had so many toys and video games. I remember going to his house and playing Pong in 1976 attached to a television. I thought it was the future. He always had all the cool Star Wars toys. And then later I learned that his home life was horrible. His parents fought and it was a, an abusive environment. And eventually the parents got divorced. So you never know. What do you think about using the PCXT with a VGA card to avoid having to use TTL converters or vintage monitors? I think it's a great solution if you have no other solution. All right, well, let's go over the pros and cons. The pros of using a VGA card in a super slow XT is that all the software that doesn't bit bang CGA hardware will work perfectly. A lot of it will work better. It will take advantage of 80 by 50 mode. So you get more rows in your text editors and your word processors. You can run any program regardless of what graphics mode it, it uses. VGA interfaces are still co are common on hardware that you can get for a dollar from Goodwill. There are a multitude of VGA to HDMI converters. So those are the pros. The cons is that if you do rely on something CGA specific, there are very few things where that would be the case, but if you wanted to run a couple of bootable games or you wanted to run like our demos or something like that, then that, that would not work. The, the major con of using VGA in a slow XT for me is any game you want to run where you can't select exactly the graphics mode you want because the game will auto detect VGA and then try to run VGA. And if it is something slow uh, or something that you can't possibly run in VGA, it's, there would be too much video memory to sling around. Then of course the game's unplayable. I'm trying to think of if there's any examples of that. Mo many, if not most games allow you to pick what graphics mode you want. You know, and the only other con really is that it's not terribly period accurate. I mean, there were people who ran VGA on XTs. It's just not, there weren't too many of them. And most of them were, who were doing it were only doing it to add soft font and higher res capabilities to WordPerfect. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not my, it's not my personal choice, but hey, if it's the only way you can get something to run because you don't have a CRT, then yeah, sure. Let's talk about vintage computing, like, like purity for a second here. If anyone tries to shame you for doing something with your vintage computer, just kick him in the face or tell him to talk to me or something. Because, you know, sometimes I'll see on discussions, people will 
take a, a perfectly good stock system and they'll be like, you know, look at this great thing I got. And everyone's like, oh, cool, it's stock, it's in perfect condition. They're like, yeah, well, I'm going to rip the motherboard out of it and put it in a, a clone AT keyboard so I can play Commander Keen, you know, or something like that. And everyone's like, you know, they get up in arms. Why would you do that? Look, it's your system. Enjoy it the way you want to enjoy it. You know, there were people who got stock hardware back in the day. I hate that phrase, but... And, and they did just that. They upgraded their machines by hacking the crap out of them and swapping the motherboard or, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many PCs I've seen with mismatched, differently colored floppy drive bezels. <laughs> and it always looks weird, but you know, hey, if that's what you want to do, it's your collection, it's your hobby. You enjoy it the way you want. The only time I've ever seen that backfire is when someone creates this like Franken clone of a system and then they try to sell it and they're like, why is no one meeting my $300 asking price? And it's because that system may be awesome and cool to you, but not to necessarily to anybody else. I mean, I saw some system that some guy was selling that had like four floppy drives in it you know, one of each, like, isn't this amazing? But it also looked like crap, like all of the bezel, like, you know, it had two beige and two black bezels. And he's like, you know, I screw this, screw eBay. How come no one's bidding on this? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe it's because you're charging double for something that is only special to you. So that's the only time I've seen it backfire. Do I have any grade school memories? Great question. I'm a little older than you. I remember playing uh, educational games, mostly typing and letter games on an Apple II in 1979. In grade school, in sixth grade, I started typing my papers on Apple Writer and I learned how to program in Logo. We had a fairly progressive school in 1982, 1983. It was a great school district, so props to my father for ensuring that we could live there and props to the uh, the curriculum administrators. And then in seventh grade, I learned basic there on the Apple II. And then there were a couple of us that were extremely advanced. Like we would complete the assignments in 10% of the time. And then we'd like go back to writing our own program. And they actually created an advanced computer curriculum course for just the five or six of us. And I mentioned my friend Court earlier in the stream, my oldest friend Court, I've known since he was, we were two and a half years old. He was also a part of that class. Those were also some fun memories, although half the time we spent writing our programs in BASIC, we were self-teaching ourselves in BASIC, and the other half of the time we were copying games, because of course we were. I will talk a little bit about Hack, part nostalgia, part trivia. Hack is the first PC game I remember copying. And some of these dates here say 86, but I got it in, I want to say 84, maybe 85. And it was okay to copy it because it was free and it was meant to. So Hack is the predecessor to NetHack. And NetHack, for those of you who don't know, is this ludicrously gigantic, complicated, intricate, involved, text-based RPG roguelike. And it had an earlier version, Hack. Let's see if some of the doc files are still on here. I've copied these files from system to system to system. Now this version is 3.6, which was 1986. But there's this, this gentleman here at the top, Don Neller, took all the C code, C code for, the, for the Unix version of Hack and he ported it to DOS. And I don't remember which compiler he used. Actually, we can cheat and take a look at what compiler he used. Let's go to the end of the exe and take a quick look. C file info. This is Microsoft C, I think. Yeah, because normally Borland C compilers have more junk at the end of them, and, and Lattice C has some more junk in it, too. So I think this was Microsoft C. Anyway, so he ported it, and it's, I believe it's MS-DOS compatible. It gets all its input from DOS, and it uses ANSI escape sequences to draw everything, which is why my screen has snow on it, because I loaded an extremely fast ANSI driver that doesn't check for snow. My brother and I spent years playing this game. I wrote a blog post, which you can read if you go to trickster.oldschool.org, spelled like this, which is my blog. If you go there, I wrote something where I finally finished this game 26 years after I started playing it. I mentioned before, this specific version is 3.6 from 1986. The original version, I think I played from 84, it was hack version like one something. 
And the major difference with the one is that it had like a cheat mode. They called it wizard mode. And you could start it up with, I think, dash W. And you would be a wizard and you'd automatically have a wand of wishing. And a wand of wishing will grant up to three of anything you want three total times. So it's like really easy to, to win the game that way. Also, in the original version of Hack, the point of Hack is to descend down through the levels and find the amulet of Yendor and bring it back up to the surface. And it is a roguelike. It looks almost exactly like rogue. I'm gonna go ahead and start it real quick. Well, guess what? I'm gonna name him after you. Pirate Gamer. So we actually start it. It asks for a save disc. We're not gonna do that. Shall I pick a character for you? If you say yes, you get a random one. I'm gonna say no. And so it asks you, so this is your character class, essentially. This game is not strict Dungeons and Dragons. It was inspired by D&D, &D which, which in turn was inspired by The Hobbit. So you have a couple of things that, that make sense. You, you're always human, but you have this character class. So a tourist has a camera that can blind monsters so you can run away. A speleologist has a pickaxe that you can use to like dig through walls. A fighter starts out with a two-handed sword. A knight starts out with a sword, shield, and armor, but doesn't have a lot of strength. So it's not as cool as you think. A caveman has 18 strength and a club. Or, and a wizard has almost no strength, but starts out with an elven cloak, which is resistant to certain forms of uh, magic or magic attacks. Uh, I'm just going to say a fighter. And then just like any roguelike, we start in what looks like Rogue, but it isn't. It's actually more involved. And again, this is the precursor to NetHack. So if you're familiar with NetHack, some of this stuff will seem familiar. If you're familiar with Rogue, some of this will seem familiar. However, it's neither. Of, it's in between the two. So we're starting. Welcome to Hack. Now it's already, we have a message. You are lucky. Full moon tonight. I always thought that was cool. Full moon tonight is like a luck bonus. And if it says careful new moon tonight, it's like a, a luck minus. Everything is text in here, so everything is represented by characters. The little D is my dog companion. A dollar sign is gold. Question mark is a scroll. If you type question mark, it'll tell you it, for help. It'll You have tons of help built into the game. So short help is, is all the keys and all the commands. Oh, and here's a fun fact. I learned VI from this game because the default movement keys before he added support for arrow keys are the VI movement keys. H will go to the left, K will go up, and so on. So so when I first sat down t at VI for the first time in Unix, uh, everyone was telling me how hard VI was to learn. And I was like, you know, I was like the girl in Jurassic Park. I'm like, this is hack, I know this. So, and to date, VI is still my favorite editor. So the game is turn-based. The lower right corner is the turn number. So if you see that lower right corner number going up, that's what it is. So nothing happens in the game until you move because it's turn-based. Usually you pick up things when you run into them. I have my defaults turn off that. Right now I ran into this scroll, but I did not pick it up. It just says you see here a scroll. The reason this you do this is because in hack, you can die from touching things. So you don't want grabbing things to be the default. But I do want this scroll, so I'm gonna pick it up. So I've done so. And then I'm gonna move over. If you run into a monster, it's the same thing as attacking it. I don't wanna attack my dog, so I'm just gonna wait. Okay, so I waited one turn, dog is gone. I move over and that is nine sling bullets. Well, I'll go ahead and pick them up. So what do I have? I is an inventory. I have a two-handed sword, which I'm wielding, and I have ring mail, which I am wearing. I also have a scroll labeled and it's and it's jumbled numbers so all the magical items you pick up in the game initially have jumbled names and you it's rings wands and potions and scrolls you don't know what they do so part of the fun of playing hack is figuring out what this stuff is now right now my scroll is labeled perutsini it's gibberish it's random every time so if i start a new game i'm going to get a completely new random for that, for whatever this scroll is. Now for giggles, I'll go ahead and read it. So let's read this scroll. It disappears. This is an identify scroll. That, wow, that's lucky. Identify scrolls let you identify what those random le letters and numbers mean. This is the best possible result. 
what an RNG. This is so great. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to identify. It's but it says what what do you want to identify? And I can I can try to look at my whole inventory, but I don't think I've got anything to actually identify. I'm just gonna hit enter. And it'll be like, do you want to identify that? No. It's plus zero. Identify that? No. Nine sling bullets? No. Okay, it's that's all you've got, dude. So I have to use this. Alright, fine, I'll use it on the sling bullets. They're plus zero sling bullets. Great. But now I've now identified that as an identify scroll, and if I pick up another identify scroll, it will say so. Part of what makes this game cool is exploration, and not all potions, wands, or scrolls have easily identifiable effects. So sometimes you'll use a wand and it's like nothing happens. But if you use the wand again in a room with an undead creature and suddenly the undead starts running away from you, you can now realize this is a wand of undead turning. So that's fun. Capital E is a floating eye. If I attack it, it will freeze me with its gaze. I don't want to do that. My dog, however, will happily attack the eye for me. Let's wait a little bit and see if he kills it for me. Come on, you can do it. The floating eye is killed. And the dog ate a dead floating eye. This game is its amazing for a text adventure, a, a text RPG, how intricate this game is. Eating a corpse can give you short-term or long-term effects. If you eat a dead floating eye, it hurts you in the short term. I think you lose hit points or you feel sick, but you then gain the ability to see if you are blinded. So that's kind of cool. Now, I see two rooms on the screen, and they are connected by two doorways and, and a corridor, and I've got nowhere to go. So is the game over? No. There are hidden doorways, and you can search for them. In this case, it's the S key. Now, I can hit S a couple of times, but what I'm going to do instead is use... Remember I said before this game taught me VI before I knew what VI was? In VI, you can do a number and a command, and it will repeat that command that number of times. So, I am going to hit... 20 is the maximum number of times you can search, so I'm going to hit 2 count, and then... Is it S? Yes, S. And it just searched 20 times, and in those 20 times, it found a hidden doorway. So, let's keep going. Okay, now this is diagonal. Sometimes, If you're not carrying a lot, you can squeeze through a diagonal space. If you are carrying a lot, it won't let you. So imagine picking up this game. It's free. It's super <coughs> detailed and intricate. And it just uses text characters. This experience is the allure of vintage computing, in my opinion. I don't know if maybe for new people, but it certainly was back then. It was like... You mean this this super simple thing can be super deep? Yes, it is. Now, a capital B... Oh, and if you don't know what something is, hack will also let you identify it. So right now I see capital B. Well, what is that? I can say, please tell me what that is. Capital B. It'll go, it's a giant bat. Okay, great. Now, giant bats are a pain in the ass because they're faster than you. They can attack and move away in the same turn, which this bat just did. The bat misses. I'm going to try to kill it. All right. So attacking monsters, you, you run into them wielding a weapon. Right now I'm wielding a two-handed sword. I'm going to run into it with the diagonal key, and I destroyed it because I'm awesome. A smoky potion, I'll go ahead and grab that. So the point of this game is to explore all the rooms, find the downwards staircase, keep, keep going down, down, down into the dungeons until you find, eventually, the amulet of Yendor, get it, grab it, and then exit alive somehow. And it is not easy. So I'm moving one step at a time here, and this can get a little tiring, so I'm actually going to use a shortcut key. If you move while holding down the shift key, it will continue to move in that direction until it finds something interesting. So instead of moving once to the left, I'm going to do shift left. All right, it stopped because I, I found an enormous rock. All right, I'm moving around the rock. Ooh, more loot. What's this? A wand. It says a zinc wand. Again, until I identify it, either by shooting it and observing its effects, or by using an identify scroll, I don't actually know what it does. Okay, gold pieces. Right now, I'm not gonna play the whole game, but I am trying to find, ooh, a whistle. I will grab the whistle. Whistles can be used to train your dog, if I remember correctly. There are shops with shopkeepers in this game, and you can't steal from them normally, because if you are carrying something unpaid and you try to leave the shop, shopkeeper will block your path but you can train your dog to run into the shop grab something and bring it out to you and i believe the whistle is part of that there is also something called a magic whistle 
and I can't remember if only wizards can use it, but it does something else. Unfortunately, I don't remember quite what. You hear some noises. The little dog ate a dead gnome. What that really means is, the d before you got there, the dog was attacking a gnome, and when you got there, he ate it. Eating is a part of this game. You have hunger. If you don't eat when you are hungry, you will get faint and weak and lose strength, and eventually you will die. That is a rat. Rats are the easiest thing to kill in this game, so it is easy for me to kill it. It it was it dropped leather armor. I don't know how a rat was carrying leather armor, but it did, so I'm going to grab it. And then finally we have greater than symbol, which if I identify it with slash, tells me it is the staircase to the next level. And my dog will follow me if he is next to me. You know what? Maybe this is a good use of the whistle. Apply is how I use the whistle. Yes, I wish to apply. I wish to use G, the whistle. It produces a high whistling sound. Now I'm hoping that means the dog is going to come find me. And I'm waiting, but he's not coming. I'm going to start doing 11 waits. Here he is. Okay, come on, dude. Get next to me. Come on. Come on. Okay, he's next to me. Now if I go down the staircase, he should be with me on the next level. He is. And I'll leave you with this. I'm going to go ahead and save the game. Maybe this is something we can do over several streams. <laughs> I'll save the game, but... What's also interesting about hack is that if you die on a level, it will leave a bones file and you can find yourself meeting your own ghost playing through the game. Once in 10 or 20 games or something, it will decide to load a bones file instead of the next level. And that can be trippy. The advantage of finding your own ghost is that all the loot you had is there and dropped and you can grab it. The disadvantage is that the ghost is really hard to kill. He's also incredibly slow to move and he's slow to attack, but he's hard to kill. And I think when he does attack, it's bad. So generally I don't fight ghosts unless uh, I'm a very high level. What's the biggest tile-based map you have ever seen on an XT game? Ideally something that fits into 64K so you don't have to get mad coding for an 8088. One of the biggest I have seen is Planet X3, which uses 32K to produce a 128 by 256 grid. That is not, that is the biggest tile map in a game I have seen where it's all in memory at once. There are larger tile-based mapped games, such as the Ultimate games, the Ultima games are, the overworld is groups of tiles, and then the map is those groups. So it's kind of like manual vector quantization for the map or something like that. It's, it's like each tile is actually a group of tiles. So that's one way to do it. I think the Ultima 4 source code documents are out there somewhere. Someone either wrote them up like type them up or they're scanned or something. If you search for Ultima source code, you can probably find them. And the complete description of how they did that tiling system is there, so it's pretty cool. One of the appeals of vintage computing as a hobby is that the systems are self-contained enough and let's be fair, simpler, simple enough that it is possible for one person to really understand all of it. And it took me decades to do that with the PC, but I do feel like I pretty much know that system. And 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 a few upwards, you know, like 286, 386, that kind of thing. But these days, yeah, it's it's I don't think any one person can really program a modern system completely, like at, at the lowest level. So so that is an appeal of, of vintage systems, absolutely. I'll just repeat what I said earlier in the stream, which is uh, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. So thanks again, guys. See you.